So let's follow up on the last episode and the panel discussion for a debt strike for the climate emergency. So after that panel discussion, the fur really started to fly. But it wasn't the establishment or the banksters. Unfortunately, it was all the panel members. And that was a bit of a surprise. Well, suffice to say that long-time friendships were lost and my interview list, my dance card for interviews, went from about five interviews to zero in about a day. Apparently I'm the laughing stock of the Doomosphere um, and it was all rather surprising. One of the good things that came out of it was that enough people were interested uh, so that a few volunteers popped up spontaneously and uh, one of them created a subreddit and I'll put that subreddit in down below but uh, I think we'll carry on and see where this goes um, really organized on that subreddit right so I think one of the reasons why that panel discussion uh, really, you know, kind of blew up afterwards and, and the subsequent days. And I think it's, I think the brouhaha is still going on and the melodrama is um, certainly the infotainment in the Doomosphere. Everybody's got their money's worth, but people are kind of asking why, why it blew up so badly. And I think I have a few ideas and I think one of them is something which I must answer because I was challenged with it and it's that you know I, I can't speak for the rest of the panel but for me I certainly am prepared to put my money where my mouth is I would go ahead and cash in my credit rating for this action I have a very good credit rating and I would cash that in uh, for this, I would, I'm all in. I would cash in my life for this. And the reason is not because I'm a big hero. It's because I know where this is going. Um, I mean, where the climate emergency and the coming collapse is going. I feel like I've lived this all before because in my youth in South Africa, this is what we were facing, really uh, a genocide of white people like me. And uh, that was what we we're staring, staring down. The rest of the world didn't quite understand the context. They misread it in terms of civil rights, but that's what it was. And I've been rather disappointed to realize I'm reliving my youth in South Africa. All the doomosphere, the, the, the climate change catastrophe, the collapse in general, has all the tone right down to the crazy ass presidents. President Trump could have been elected to be one of the crazy ass fascist presidents in South Africa during the apartheid years. He just fits in perfectly. The way the news is working, the way the dialogue is unfolding, the denialism, all of this is something deeply familiar to me and I know where it ends. And believe me, it's not like the cinematic Hollywood style that all these Duma channels presume. they all rather adolescent, infantile, um, and uh, yeah, there's denialism everywhere. So there's another group that kind of thinks, oh, you know, this is uh, collapse entertainment. So this is all info infotainment. The Doomosphere is one big um, extravaganza of infotainment, and they're going to watch the planet collapse while they drink a beer. It's all going to be on TV. Okay, I think that's highly, highly unlikely. The way Collapse will go, if it went like my experience, uh, it'll go something more like uh, you won't be drinking a beer and watching this on TV because you won't be able to afford a beer. It'll cost a month's salary. You'll lose your, your TV and probably your house somewhere down the line uh, because the economy collapses. And when the cl climate catastrophe catches up with you, it'll probably be a knock on the door sometime in the middle of the night after a grid down event. That's how you'll meet climate catastrophe. 
Basically, you'll see it on the TV for sure, but eventually it comes so that people around you, you're hearing, you know, Tom next door, you know, Jackie across the road, or all, all the suddenly these disasters come closer and closer in, and then suddenly they visit you one day. In in some terms, you know, you you can't really tell what it'll be. I can tell you one thing: if you're prepping for it by getting a gun and a bunker, um, that isn't going to work out very well for you at all. In South Africa, I think the statistic was uh, everybody that was shot, so the the whites that were shot, sixty percent with their own weapons. Um, I think it might be the same in the U.S. If you're not being shot by a cop, you're being shot by yourself. And that's really the destiny of most weapons bought for self-protection. So think of that if you're a prepper. Okay. Now, this leads me to the next thing that I've kind of been accused of. And that's, that. okay, so it's kind of the hypocrisy of it all. So then, you know, a a rich guy um, sitting on a private yacht, then you know, bullshitting all these schemes that everybody else is supposed to do in the real world um, seems a little ridiculous. Okay, now, I must clear that point up because that's what I was accused of too. Um, I'm not rich. Uh, I'm a working stiff, or I was until March last year. I worked in cybersecurity as a software architect uh, for this company in Houston. So let me explain to you my background in that sphere. Um, I set myself up so I could do this kind of activism. The boat is my prepping strategy. I was working remotely for a company in Houston, a cybersecurity company, um, out of Seattle. And I decided that I would sell up and go to sea so I could do this kind of activism and and prep for the same time. I figured that nobody knows how collapse unfolds, but one thing you want to be able to be is a nomad. You don't want to be fixed in the spot. And that's mistake number one for most people. They're basically finding their little hidey hole and they're putting all their eggs in that basket. It's very unlikely you know how that hidey hole is going to pan out. So basically, if you stick a pin in the map, uh, really, that is a rather unfortunate gamble because if you look at previous times, 1929, all these kind of things that are still in our memory, uh, the Great Depression, people were very mobile. They became nomadic to try and survive it. And it's happening now. All Trump's caravans coming up from the south, uh, those are climate catastrophe nomads. Uh, all the way back into history, into 1174, the collapse of the entire world, 1174 BC. Uh, the, what made that collapse, made the ancient world collapse here in Crete, the Minoans disappeared, or everybody except maybe the Egyptians just, just ha- hung on. But all the major empires of that time, right from the Persian um, to the Lydian, they all disappeared suddenly in almost one year. Now, what that's pinned on is the sea people. The sea people were Trump's caravans, in in effect. They were marauding bands of displaced people that were well-armed and they were migrating from a climate catastrophe, as far as anybody can tell. So during 1929 and the Depression, then you have the Okies um, you know, in the Dust Bowl and they migrate to California and California tries to put up a wall that you know, against the Constitution, they tried to shut California off from these migrating Okies. They would have big posters up saying, you know, keep going, you know, the hobos on the trains, riding the trains. They would uh, try and get the bulls in the in the train yards to not let them get off in their towns because they would cause trouble. Uh, you know, basically there would be friction. So all of these things uh, I'm just saying is, you know, my strategy for being mobile. Um, Also, one thing that colored my thinking in terms of getting a boat was uh, the fact that when I first came to America, I was in Los Angeles and the Rodney King riots had just happened. Now, that's something which you might um, face somewhere in your town is something like the Rodney King riots is is an obvious kind of event uh, that might be coming your way. Uh, So 
I had some friends that had a boat and I often would go out with them on their boat. Um, and they said that when I arrived just after the Rodney King rides and they told me about their experience in it, um, the company I was at and brought over to America uh, to work at was in Santa Monica. Like a typical American corporation in the middle of the riots, they said, everybody out. We don't want to take the liability and the insurance, so you all have to leave the safety of this office that's all protected by security because we won't take the risk. Go home. Some people had to cross the most dangerous areas of Los Angeles in the middle of the riots, and my friends were one of them. They went to their place in Long Beach, and they had people running down the streets, uh, you know, basically rioting in their in their own streets in suburbia. And so they took to their yacht. Uh, they went and parked offshore in uh, off Los Angeles Harbor. And they watched Los Angeles go up in smoke while they drank a glass of wine. And I made a mental note that that's the way <laughs> to handle the apocalypse. Uh, so... All these things came in and that's why I'm on a boat. I'm not rich by any means, sorry to tell you. I wish I was. I'm living on my capital. I was laid off in March last year. Uh, and uh, I was laid off because I was, in, I, I was amazed I lasted so long in the company. After I decided I was in Seattle working remotely. I could be anywhere in the world. Why do I want to be working out of a home office here? So without asking, because I knew they would say no... I sold up and just went and bought a yacht and then carried on telecommuting into work from my yacht and everybody was a little surprised, but they couldn't exactly say anything. I thought they'd put up with it for about six months. In the end, I worked remotely from this yacht for two years and I saved my money like crazy, just knowing that one day it would end because I was one of the most, the highest paid people in the company um, and I had a director, a guy from Russia, uh, who was refused an American entry visa, so he couldn't even go to the head office, and he was jealous of my lifestyle on the boat so badly, he just, he, he, it, it was almost embarrassing, he was al almost, in, would almost spit in public, he was so seething with jealousy that I was sailing around the med while he was sitting in an office in Cardiff. So... I knew my time was limited. I was amazed it carried on so long um, and I saved up my money like crazy and I'm living on the capital um, that I saved up. So yeah, the boat chews through the capital, but my carbon footprint is uh, the size of a church mass. Um, I have solar that makes water and powers everything I do uh, right down to my computer and this video. Um, uh, it makes water for me, and I just eat local food, maybe mainly veg uh, vegetarian stuff from the local Greek markets. Um, it's very, very cheap, but the problem is a boat then every now and again, like the engines uh, broke last year, six grand, ka straight away. So, um, yeah, you can live very responsibly on a boat. I gave my car up. So I have no car. I burn a little fuel going in and out of harbors, and that's it for my carbon footprint, basically. Uh, so I got set up like this so I could do this kind of activism. So I'm all in. I'm absolutely all into this. So I wanted to answer that and settle my circumstances and the fact that people don't understand that the sailing community and they don't understand that people... A lot of people afloat. You get all types of float. You get the rich to the absolutely dirt poor. But there are a number of anarchists. There are a lot of people that have just doomers, that have just given up on humanity. And they're enjoying the last years um, of our existence afloat. And it's wonderful to be in touch with nature afloat. Um, it's, it's a fantastic thing to do as long as you don't mind drowning at sea. Because the chances of that go up exponentially now. Especially... Because the climate is going nuts and the chances that you die at sea are quite high. So you can't do it. I'm not recommending it as a, uh, you know, wow, that's the, the thing you should do uh, in the end times. If you like sailing, it's a fantastic thing to do. One of the downsides of it is that 
you're cut off from everybody else. Everybody else is, is stuck in this abstract view of collapse and the climate catastrophe. But for sailors, you're living it. The weather's going crazy. It's getting really scary. And it's real. You live climate change. On the other hand, you in the last of nature, on this beautiful blue sphere that we live on, and you're seeing her in all her radiant beauty. Um, the experiences I've had, especially at night on this boat, are absolutely indescribable. But it's not for everybody. I just raise this... Uh, to tell you where I'm coming from and answer some of these things that, you know, I'm a huge hypocrite, no, rich bastard on a yacht. Okay, so that was one of them. The other one that was raised was, oh yeah, I'm a cult leader. And, you know, I'm a Pied Piper. Well, okay, let me answer the Pied Piper one first. Is Yeah, I would like to be a kind of a Pied Piper, but not the kind of Pied Piper that, you know, pipes the rats out of the city and then when he doesn't get paid, come back and take all the children out the same way. I'm the kind of Pied Piper that gets all the children to kill the rats in the city. That's what I'm about. Okay, now, the accusation of being a cult leader, and this one is very important, and I'm going to dedicate this, really, this whole video to this whole issue of cults, because it's crucially important. Am I a cult leader? Um, I'm half a cult leader. You see, let me explain cults and cult leaders to you. And it's very important uh, because it's important with this whole story I'm trying to tell you and the warning I'm trying to give, uh, give to you in general about cults. So... I could be a full-on cult leader. I have all I know all the tools of the trade. My formative years were in a cult, as I mentioned before. The best times of my life were in that cult. Um, that cult, they wrote a book about it in 1985. Um, it's probably out of print now, but I'll put a link down to the book about it. It's called The Secret Cult. And yeah, that... That has dominated my life, for sure. Uh, it's been the biggest determinant in my life, uh, being in that cult and the experiences I had in it. Um, my mother, who's still alive and living in South Africa, uh, is really an academic. She's got lots and lots of degrees, and one of them, in things like philosophy, languages, um, in the arts, and one of them is in, uh, her degrees in, is in comparative religion. She got a master's in comparative religion and her master's thesis was on my experience in that cult. So, yeah, cults is one of the things I know very, very well and cult leaders. Okay, so let me tell you what cults are. Now, you probably think, oh, you know what a cult is. It's uh, like Jim Jones and uh, the People's Temple. It's like Heaven's Gate and Marshall Applewhite. It's like David Koresh and uh, the Branch Davidians in Waco. You say, you are right. That is what a cult is. But you don't know the extent of it. So, Margaret Singer was, I think she died in uh, 20, 2003, I think. She died around about then. Uh, but she was the world expert on cults. Now, she reminds me a lot of Robert Hare. Robert Hare, I mentioned before, and he's the world expert on psychopaths. And both of them are kind of the same in that they came from academia. They got fascinated, on the one hand, by psychopaths, and those are cult leaders, and Margaret Singer got fascinated by cults. Those are the organizations that psychopaths create. Now, Robert Hare came out of his ivory tower in academia and his clinical practice and 
happened to study the workplace in America and was shocked to discover that it wasn't about 1% of people that were psychopaths. There were vast numbers and they were out there in the workplace and he wrote a book to tell all his colleagues, like, we've way underestimated that they're out there in dozens of numbers. They just don't come into the clinic. That's why we don't see them. Margaret Singer did roughly the same thing and said, you know, she started off with these cults, religious cults, and as she went, she found that they were more and more all over the place, and she warned people more and more and wrote these books about cults. And she's exactly like Robert Hare, because what she didn't realize was something that Robert Hare actually realized, that a corporation is like a psychopath. American corporation is a cult. And you say, whoa, 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 come on, come on, that's ridiculous. I mean, what corporations? I mean, is Jeff Bezos going to take Amazon out to Guyana, give all his followers Kool-Aid, and they're all going to snuff in the jungle? And say, given enough rope, he would. And let me explain that. So, first the word cult. The word cult comes from quell. It's the Sanskrit word that means roughly to cluster around, to revolve around, really to orbit around. So a cult means that really it's uh, usually a charismatic leader in the center. He's the center of gravity. And then you have all these satellites of people orbiting around him. Well, often him, sometimes her, but very more often him. So it's like a big hole, a big black hole at the center of a galaxy and all these celestial bodies are orbiting around. As the orbit decays, they sink into the black hole and the black hole will ultimately suck them in and annihilate them. That's the nature of a cult. They all snuff cults. So there's only doomsday cults and snuff cults. It's crucial that you realize that. Why? Because almost everything is a cult. United States itself is a cult. It has charismatic leaders that initiated it, like George Washington. He's a cult leader. He's leading a cult against the British cult. The word cult and quell is the same word for culture. Anything that has a culture is a cult. So there's a corporate culture that makes corporations cults. The FBI is a cult. It has a culture just like the CIA and the NSA. They all have their own subcultures within the American culture. It's a cult within a cult. Now all of them are snuff cults. What we're living through with the climate catastrophe now and collapse is really a predestined outcome for a doomsday cult. America is a doomsday cult. The British Empire was a doomsday cult. The Industrial Revolution was really uh, a cult as well. And I'll get back to, to that. But all the CO2 emitted comes from the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was how the elites of the British cult, let's call say, that it's uh, Queen Victoria. She's the cult leader of the imperial cult and the culture of imperialism. So she and her cronies, they create the Industrial Revolution to stave off the pitchforks. They're doing it to stave off a genuine lose the heads of the aristocracy um, kind of revolution. So all the revolutions, in, in some sense, the Green Revolution, and now these, you know, all these New Deals, the Greed New Deals, and uh, all these big uh, hyper-industrialization efforts, you know, like the, the fourth industrialization, they call it. Yeah, well, all of these things are the same. they all designed to head off genuine old French-style cut-your-head-off revolutions. They there to bleed the passions out of the population and to divert them from the pitchforks. And that's what I think the Green New Deal and all these kind of uh, enterprises are as well. So, 
how does a cult leader come about? Well, cult leaders are normally people on the fringe or the outside. And they look at a culture, their own culture. And because it's a culture, remember, they all snuff cultures. They're all doomsday cultures. They're all predestined to destroy themselves in the Jonestown manner or some variation thereof. So what happens with a cult leader is they see where this is going. If you say Jesus in his culture, he's a schizophrenic on the outside and he can see that if we carry on like this, we all doomed. So he starts a breakaway cult to save people. And that's what Jim Jones was doing. I'll post a video down below and I would urge you to watch it. A video about Jim Jones and when you watch it, substitute the name Jim Jones for the alien cortex and substitute the people's temple Substitute in your mind, every time you hear, hear the word People's Temple, substitute America. America is just one giant big prosperity cult. And all its adherents came as massive in immigration across the Atlantic to join in this prosperity cult. It's, it's part of the cult mythology. Uh, cults have an origin story, and the American origin story is this cult myth that people came there because they wanted freedom, they wanted tolerance, horseshit. They wanted prosperity. America's a prosperity cult. All of them came there because they wanted to prosper in this new cult, same as any prosperity or televangelist cult today. So when you watch this Jonestown massacre, uh, you can't watch it enough. Watch it again and again and again and think, uh, of Jones and what he's doing. He is the quintessential alien cortex. You see, all of this is the alien cortex. The alien cortex is essentially your ego, this part of your brain, here, right here, a little bit here, but mainly here. It's that little voice in your head going yada, yada, yada all the time, the little critic, the little the big ego, always arguing, arguing, arguing. It's the thing that's going to make you go down in the comment section below this video and do your nya, 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 nya. And because you can't get that under control, that's why we're going extinct. That's the reason for the greenhouse gas emissions. It comes from our culture. It comes from our culture of exploitation. All of that comes from the alien cortex. Uh, it's because we cannot get that thing under control. Okay, so as a cult leader, they can see all of this coming. They can see they're in a culture, in a snuff culture. They can see where it's headed. And they start telling people, stop. If you go this direction, we're all doomed. Uh, it's just imagine Roger Hallam, uh, to take a contemporary example in XR. It's, it's a cult leadership. It's not a, uh, I'm not being pejorative towards um, Roger Hallam. Everybody is. Bezos is. Uh, Melinda Gates is a cult leader and so is a sidekick, Bill Gates. But the Gates Foundation and Melinda Gates are a cult. Uh, they're trying to evolve a counterculture. Um, all of this is cult behavior. They cannot help it because they're operating from the alien cortex and a cult is almost the collective noun for a group of alien cortexes. So cultivation, uh, agriculture, all of these things are all part of cults. Uh, that's it's all Gebekli Tepe, straight back to Gebekli Tepe. Anyway, let's get back to uh, somebody like Jim Jones or Jesus or Roger Hallam. Uh, they basically they're people on the fringe that can see because they're slightly outsiders, they can see where this is going, where other people can't. So they try and save them from being sucked into the center, into this big black hole in the center that's going to absorb all these satellites. And they say, don't do that. Throw off your chains and follow me. Now that's half right. You see, I'm a, cult, I'm a half cult leader. What I'm trying to do is say, throw up your chains and not follow me. Throw up your chains and don't follow anybody. 
See, what normally happens is the cult leader says, throw off your chains and follow me. I'll lead you away from the black hole. But it's an alien cortex again. And so they create their own black hole. And these people get into orbit around the breakaway group. So the very thing that's trying to save them becomes the thing that's now going to condemn them because it's just another black hole that they in orbit around. The same dynamic as the alien cortex. It's just another version of we meet our fates on the roads we take to avoid them. And in this case, the cult leader is trying to draw people away so they can avoid the fate of being sucked in to the cultural center uh, the big black hole that's going to suck everybody into doom, into, in, into the cultural center. And they haul them away like Moses taking you know, all the Israelites into the desert. Um, and really what's, because they're not self-aware, they don't see that they're just making a whole new black hole that eventually becomes, say, the Christian church. The Christian church is a cult. It's... Uh, Paul's cult. So Paul, he's, uh, he's a trader out of Turkey. He's uh, Saul, Saul. So this guy, Saul, a Turk, uh, makes this cult out of uh, Jesus the schizophrenic's uh, followers. And he has this epiphany that, yes, he can break away and f uh, save all this group of special people that are, can hear and escape this gyre into the center of the black hole. Not realizing, of course, that he's just a new center, and then he becomes the Pope, so the Pope sits not on St. Peter's throne, it's really St. Paul's cult that's going on in the Vatican. And it's a snuff cult, just like all the rest. It's full of eschatology, it's full of revelations and the end times, and don't look to the Pope to help with climate change. He's in the business of basically eschatology and the end times in the rapture. So it's ultimately this, this sucking into the thing is the rapture. It's the Christian rapture. It's the alien cortex is, is suicidal, really. It, it, it's Thanatos. It's what I mentioned before. It's the death drive. So these cult leaders, uh, they see all this. They get all this. And they haul out the people that can hear. They pull them back from the brink uh, of this insanity being sucked down the well. In doing so, they create a new well, as I said. Now, what normally happens, if you have a look at, say, David Koresh is a very good example of this. They try and break away. Um, Jim Jones, too, he makes a bunker. He knows that there's going to be nuclear war. It's all doom time. He's just a bit ahead of his time, but, you know, pretty much where everybody is today with climate change, uh, just in, in the 60s. And he's prepping, he's doing prepping way before prepping is invented, it's all there. And what happens is the same uh, with David Koresh, he's uh, also doing pre uh, prepping, they go out uh, into Waco, make, make their little um, bunker uh, to survive the end times. In doing so, they run up against the NIMBY culture. So the not-in-my-backyard culture of the prevailing cult they try to escape. At some point, some of the locals go, I'm sure these people are counterculture. They're not really part of our American culture, are they? And they go and call the cultural police, which is the FBI or somebody like that, and they start pointing fingers and say, these are outside the body politic. The FBI, which is a cult in itself, comes in and it behaves like an immune system. It determines quickly that David Koresh, a harmless guy who's not going to do anything left to himself, uh, he is really a foreign organism. He is now going to be purged out of the system. So they make a mistake of sending in a SWAT team and he, David Koresh, defends himself uh, and so now he's killed a few members of the opposing cult, which is the FBI. The FBI is the stronger cult and you can see very clearly, uh, if you listen to the tapes of the negotiators talking, the FBI negotiators the, uh, talking to the Branch Davidians and David Koresh, the same one as David Koresh. The insane one is the FBI. They've had lost some of their members and they are going to wipe out David Koresh 
no matter what. Eventually they go and they torch the place and then they cover their tracks by, uh, you know, confiscating all the video material and pictures. But there are one or two that are left and you can see quite plainly they send in tanks with flamethrowers uh, to kill all the branch Davidians and their children, right? Always the excuse, right? Oh, so this is one of the things I must mention, the children. So, the uh, Margaret Singer, the expert on cults, she's all mammalian brain, you know. She's doing all of this to save the children. She's also a kind of a cult leader in fighting cults because she's like, uh, well, they all drifting into the cult quell orbit of this cult leader i must save the children so she's going to rescue the children that's what she was all about um, the branch davidians everybody supports the fbi going in there a lot of the complaints are because he's sucking away the children he's pied piper he's taking uh, away our children so our culture is a culture of ownership all the way down to children it's bizarre it's the most fucked up culture you could possibly believe in but we think we own our children it's ridiculous we, we're doomed from the start once you your own your sense of ownership and entitlement means that you feel you own the own own everything down to the children you know at least have the village own the children but not a man and a woman own the ch a child oh, well don't let me get me started on that but anyway the excuse that makes everybody support the FBI, the cult of the FBI, is because they're going to save the children. They're going to save the children from the branch Davidians. And that's what happened to Jim Jones. Eventually, he realizes he's not safe in America. He has to go to Guyana. And eventually, they hound him there. Why? Because they're coming to get the children back. Exactly. They're doing the opposite of the cult leader. Uh, and, you know, I'm talking children here. I mean, we're talking over 18. So oh, they have a majority, um, you know, they they not, they have seniority. So legally, this is illegal going to get the kids out of uh, Jonestown. But that's what happened. Same thing as Waco, shots fired. Uh, and then Jones knows that he's doomed. Uh, so... He takes everybody down with him. He knows he's going to die. So he does what an alien cortex always does. And this is what I've told you time and time again. If you get one thing out of this video, and if you get one thing out of this series, please let it be this. Alien cortex are filled with hubris and thanatos, the death wish. And when they are absolutely cornered, they will commit suicide and they will take the ego, everything within the ego boundary down with them. So in terms of um, Jim Jones, his ego boundaries is the people's temple. So everybody is going to die with him because he's going to die. He's going to make, make it so. Same thing, everything down to Hitler. Now this is important because uh, Trump is a cult leader of the American prosperity cult. Um, these guys, when they go down, they will take everything within the ego boundary. So they will take down America. Okay, that's the extent of the ego boundary and the extent of their cult. So I warn you about this again and again and again. Um, they are suicidal and they will take down everything they can with you. And that's what happens in Jonestown. This is the lesson. This is the lesson why we don't want to be doing Green New Deals. They, the Great Leap Forward, right? So Great Leap Forward, uh, just like the Cultural Revolution in China, was Mao Zedong trying to save his neck, again, by diversion. By diverting the pitchforks away from him, he's the cult leader, and he does the great diversionary tactic of saying, well, we will engineer our way out of it. That's what geoengineering it is. It's engineering your way out of the consequences that the alien cortex put you in. So it's the alien cortex trying to engineer itself out of the problem that it made from engineering. And that's what geoengineering is. That's what Mao's uh, Great Leap Forward is. Uh, that's what the Greed New Deal is. They're all trying to, you know, the sustainable energy cult is um, the green cult. It's, it's all trying to engineer their way out of the consequences of engineering. The original engineering, of course, being the Industrial Revolution. 
Queen Victoria's way of engineering herself out of the fact that London's population was growing, the burgeoning population was getting restless, they were heading for revolution, they bled that passion out, as they always do, the psychopaths, that is, they bleed that out into a new deal. They bleed it out into an industrial revolution, into a great leap forward, into a cultural revolution, and they do it to save their own necks. That's why big business and Melinda Gates and her pal, uh, that's why they support all these things, to stave off the pitchforks. So, what am I in all of this? I am the kind of cult leader trying to draw you away. But I am saying, throw off your chains. Don't follow me. Don't follow anybody. That's what I'm about. So, you be a free agent. Don't get sucked into anybody's orbit. Now, I have to point out that if you throw off your chains, yay, will you be free then? No, you will not be free because you still have the alien cortex right here. You still need self-mastery. If you don't master yourself, this alien cortex right here in your skull will kill you just as sure as Queen Victoria or any other one of these psychopaths down from Jim Jones to Marshall Applewhite to David Koresh. You have a David Koresh here in your skull. Okay, so how do you achieve self-mastery? By killing the alien cortex. So, the alien cortex emerges out of our global culture, our culture of exploitation, our culture of industrialization, our culture of, uh, of really incarceration. It's a slave-owning, extortionate culture. Um, it came, it was given its mandate from the Bible. The Bible was written by Mr. Nasty right here uh, as a self-justification for himself. But out of this mega culture comes a meta alien cortex. And that's what I've been calling the psychopaths all along. So all these people, the leaders in industry, the uh, Lloyd Blankfeld, the Jamie Dimon, the Bezoses of the world, the Elon Musk of this world, all these people you think of leaders and look up to uh, uh, that are really just alien cortexes and making a culture. So, you know, I come from Seattle, uh, by the way. So I, I know all about Amazon. I've been, I've, they've tried to recruit me for Amazon many times and I refused every time, but I knew people that were sucked into the orbit of that big black hole <clears throat> called Bezos, uh, running his little cult there, and I'm telling you, it's a cult. Uh, so, everybody in Amazon um, is under pressure to do all the things that Margaret Singer said in her uh, checklist, which is rather like Robert Hare's checklist of uh, psychopathy. Her checklist is for a cult, and I'll read it off to you now to explain to you exactly why an American corporation like Amazon or any other is not particularly against Amazon because they all that way. There isn't any other sort. Uh, but listen to this checklist and tell me if you can't recognize an American corporation in, because it's every American corporation I've ever worked in is described by Margaret Singer's checklist for a cult. And here it is. Keep the person unaware of what's going on, and now she or he is being changed a step at a time. Control the person's social and or physical environment. Especially control the person's time. Systematically create a sense of powerlessness in the person. Manipulate a system of rewards, punishments and experiences in such a way as to inhibit behavior that reflects the person's formal social identity. Manipulate a system of rewards, punishments and experiences in order to promote learning the group's ideology or belief system and group-approved behaviors. Put forth a closed system of logic and an authoritarian structure that permits no feedback and refuses to be modified except by leadership, approval, or executive order. Okay, so out of this culture we have, 
emerges this meta-alien cortex out of all the partial little alien cortexes we all have in our heads. So I've been saying that just like mastery of yourself, self-mastery entails killing your alien cortex. Self-mastery for the human species involves killing the meta-cortex. It means eliminating all these people that you assume as thought leadership um, and the leaders of this culture. Now, that's alarming for most people because I just really set out there what a lot of people think but not prepared to say. Okay, so does that mean we take up a knife and start stabbing people? Well, no, it's not actually necessary. If you scroll back up to where I said alien cortexes, once they're surrounded, defeated, once they're in a checkmate situation, as long as they think they uh, cannot get out of it, they commit suicide anyway. They do the job for you. We don't have to have a night of the long knives running around slitting the throats of the elites. Uh, that's unnecessary. You just have to ruin them. So all the rich bastards that will engineer us into ultimately FEMA camps where we will die like Jim Jones in the jungle as things get worse on this planet, all of them will kill themselves. They'll do the job for us. You just ruin them. You just ruin the lives. You ruin, uh, you take all their money away. Uh, you corner them, checkmate. They top themselves anyway. So since Roman times, that's what aristocrats uh, and alien cortex all over the place, from Cleopatra to you name it, um, they all commit suicide just like Jim Jones. All you have to do is to ruin them. Back to the debt strike. That's how you ruin them. You, the slaves, are shackled. You are shackled with debt. The reason why they did this shackling is because you were primate. Your primate brain has this defect in it. Not a defect for a primate, but it certainly is in the alien cortex culture. So in the world of culture, the cultured man is subject to this dreadful hubris. The dreadful hubris is that the primate brain's instinct for debt repayment is more important than life itself. Okay, I'll say that again. Primate's instinct for debt repayment is more important than life itself. So what these psychopaths do is they exploit that. They put you in debt. They have some kind of debt obligation. If you're Jim Jones, uh, you, you give people love. You, you have the good parts that draws people in into this... Uh, into your orbit um, with all this good stuff. Uh, you, in Shakespeare's terms, you know, they win you with honest trifles to betray you in deepest consequence. So this drawing in is the good part. They draw you in with culture and all the toys and the icons and the iPhones and all, this, uh, all the goodies. Uh, that's what draws you into the culture and then it's also what will eventually uh, the thing that destroys you but how they draw you in is by having an obligation so everybody that feels this love gets huge meaning to life uh, then that meaning to life and meaningfulness if you if you want part of the dregs if you're on the skids you're an alcoholic you're about to go down the tubes then you've saved the person's life if they come into the orbit of uh, Jim Jones he will eventually kill them but for the moment uh, they owe him their lives and it's the same in our culture so uh, they get you with debt financial obliga obligation that your primate brain will pay on pain of death and so a debt uh, strike like we're proposing here is a monumental effort it means that you are no longer a primate it means you have mastered your primate side because you can say in one letter, you can say, write, declare that you are mentally, even if not physically, that you haven't actually been able to take the fetters off yet. 
you have declared in one letter of intent, you've said to your slave master, the plantation owner, that I am taking off my fetters on November the 5th. That declaration alone ruins the slave master. Now, understand that he's a plantation owner. His whole life is vested in the plantation. See, what they have us doing now is they have us running around saying, oh, the plantation's in trouble and we need the slaves to work ten times harder and do green new deals and well, it's time for action and stuff. And say, no. If you have self-mastery as a slave, you say to the slave owner, that's your problem, Massa, not my problem. Let the slave plantation burn down to the ground. You see, if you declare yourself free on those fetters, think of it from the plantation owner's point of view. His entire assets are vested in this going concern, the plantation. The plantation's no longer a going concern if the slaves sit down and say, on November the 5th, they take in off their fetters. Whether they can, whether they do, hardly matters. That they declared it is the thing. Because from that moment on, the plantation is dysfunctional. It is worth nothing on the open market. The plantation owner cannot sell his biggest asset, the plantation, because the slaves have just announced that they are a no-go. In other words, the plantation is a no-go. So effectively, from that moment, even while they sit with chains on their legs or around their necks, the fact that they declared, they all declared that they're going to take them off, means that slavery in that plantation is no longer viable, the plantation's no longer viable, and when the plantation owner knows that, they are ruined. The plantation owner does exactly what all aristocrats do. They top themselves. And that's what self-mastery is on the bigger scale for our bigger culture. How to achieve self-mastery of yourself once you're out of orbit from these black holes, these cultural leaders, these charismatic people uh, that suck you in uh, to your doom? How to achieve self-mastery over your own alien cortex I will tell you, or begin to tell you, in the next episode. But I hope this made some sort of sense to you. Anyway, I look forward to getting back to the more esoteric path and telling you about the asanas and the meditation and how to achieve self-mastery. Otherwise, you're just a slave to yourself and you will wind up being your own Jim Jones if you're not careful.